if you remember the last talk that I gave was actually on Buddhist cosmology, on the 31 planes of existence. I just go through it again, just to refresh your memory on this. There are these 31 planes of existence. One thing I always think is important is that, you know, the downfalls, the, you know, the bad destinations, actually only four. 27 of those destinations are actually sugatis. That means good destinations. You know, only a few of them are actually bad destinations. So the Buddhist view of the universe is quite optimistic or whatever, you know. There's kind of like lots of good things out there and only a few kind of not so nice things out there. These are the lower realms. And you've got Manusa Loka in between. This is where we are in the universe. Right above those lokas, we come to the Brahma lokas, which is here. Now, this is um, where we're going to start really today. Because last time when I was talking, what we were doing was like taking a section through the universe, kind of uh, analyzing all the different planes of existence as they exist at one given time. But not all the planes of existence are there all the time. So what we're going to look now is at the evolution of the universe and the devolution of the universe. Because all of these realms that we were looking at, the hell realms, the human realms, and the devaloka, at certain times they all pass away. And all you're left with are these higher realms. When the world comes to a destruction, after a long, long time, of course, and then it re-begins. You know, when scientists or whatever talk about the Big Bang, they take it all the way back to the Big Bang. That's the beginning of a new evolution of the world. But they don't see where it's come from before that time. So it evolves, devolves, and then large parts of the universe are destroyed completely, and then it, it re-evolves again. But it's not our worlds, you know, it's not at our level. That means this kind of gross, kind of human world that we live in, that's, you know, gone. At one time, uh, when the world is destroyed, it's destroyed by fire. And then it's destroyed not only up to those Deva Lokas, but also up to the first Brahma level. All of that passes away as well, up until this level. That means even the Maha Brahmas, which is super refined, long-lasting beings in the universe, even Maha Brahmas, are wiped away by it and they're wiped away by fire and the fire is caused by lust becoming prominent if you like in the universe it's the equivalent you see of the first jhana they say when the world has been destroyed seven times it's gone through seven evolutions and devolutions and destroyed through lust and then you know, the, the actual destructive power is, is fire, then you get the next one, which is like a giant tsunami. It's the power of water. You know, the universe is being destroyed, if you like, by the elements. Yeah, so the first element is fire. The second element is water. So it's like a huge tsunami which wipes away all the lower worlds, including the human realms, the God, God levels, but also the first two Brahma levels as well. So, you know, you have got things higher. You've got the Sudawasa here. That means the Pure Lands are here. And the Ayatana, that's the formless realms. These are still form realms, yeah? It's within the form worlds. But up until, you know, it's about here or something like that, then 
that all gets washed away in a giant tsunami. And that's caused by hate. Because of hate being the prominent defilement in the world, then it's destroyed up until the Arbasara Brahmaloka, and it's destroyed by a huge tsunami. So the third one is winds. So the tornado is when delusion is very strong in the world. You know, when your mind is deluded, it's like this kind of like rushing, uncontrolled kind of uh, movement in the mind or something like that. Okay, this is as far up as it goes, actually. There, there isn't a fourth one, if you see what I mean. When the world is destroyed at its highest possible level, you still have the pure lands are still there. That's where the Anagamis would be living and the ayatanas are still there that's where the you know people who have attained formless attainments or whatever have been uh, reborn sometimes when the world is destroyed it reaches the arbasara brahmaloka this is this this level then following that beings self luminous beings are born in the universe. Not things like human beings, you see. Not things like hell beings. Not even gods, like these kind of, um, you know, like Saka and Santusita. What are reborn are self-luminous beings. A self-luminous being is a being that is lit up by its own inner purity, if you like. That means all the other beings, you know, have been destroyed. It's only beings coming out of the Arbasara Brahma Loka, which is a very high, a high world. Only creatures that are at that level are being reborn in the next evolution. Initially, actually, only one gets reborn. But afterwards, more than one gets reborn. So you get like a universe full of these luminous beings that are just emanating light and there's no other you know there's no other beings below them no nothing gross at this point is happening they've gone out from a very high level and they've been reborn into a very high level Th these of course are stars you know because we are talking about evolution and in evolution the stars form first. So self-luminous beings, like the suns, the stars in the universe, are actually formed first. Only later do you get the condensation of matter, which forms planets. Afterwards, what happens is that a kind of crust appears below these luminous beings a kind of crust appears then it says like some matter condenses and this matter is like the hardened skin on hot milk that is becoming cool and that's that skin is uh, very sweet they say it's, it's as sweet as wild honey. Now what happens with these beings? They get curious about the cream pie and one of them puts its finger into it and then tastes it. And it's really, really delicious. And so he wants more and he takes another one and another one. And then the other beings, these other luminous beings, they do the same. So they start eating. They're attracted by the sensuality in this cream pie. Because of that, their bodies start to become gross. They were self-luminous beings, just pure light when they were reborn. And then they get attracted by matter and they become more gross in their own bodies. Then that cream pie 
disappears and fungus arises in the world which is somewhat more gross than the the previous matter was but still it's very very tasty and they're attracted by the fungus as well actually fungus of course is not very sweet but but at that time in the devolution of the of the universe okay fungus is as sweet as wild honey so you've got to use your imagination this is all telling a psychological story as well it, it's a parable if you understand it when beings become attracted sent by sensual matters you know their minds become gross even if your mind is refined so far refined that you're up to the second jhana level when you get attracted by sensuality you come back down into the body it's a parable actually but it's not only a parable as i was saying last time what is true in the psychological world in buddhism is true in the cosmological world the kind of things that happen in the uh, psychological world also happen in the cosmological world so this describes how the world devolves but it also describes how your mind devolves as well attracted by very refined sensual objects when you're in something like second jhana you go down a level and then attracted again at that level you go down a level otherwise it just sounds like a fairy story or something isn't it but if you understand it psychologically as well what it's telling as well then you know it kind of has a reality for yourself so at the second level they start eating these very sweet mushrooms and then the third level is actually supposed to be uh, it's like grass and this grass is also very tasty and very attractive so these beings who are becoming you know more and more gross they get attracted by this sweet grass and they start eating this sweet grass again their bodies become more gross in this devolution the next thing that arises is rice and this rice is not like the rice that we have now because we're devolving eh? so <laughs> this rice you actually take the crop in the morning and it's grown back by the evening you don't have to work for it or anything like that you don't you don't have to sow it and wait months and months for it to come to fruition and then take it you take it in the morning you eat it and by the evening it's grown back and you can eat some more and the morning it's grown again and you can eat some more in actual fact everything you need physically they're getting more and more kind of gross of course they're down into kind of more gross bodies now but everything they need physically to survive is actually provided for them so then they start becoming greedy one of these kind of beings now thinks he has what is like a good idea in a way he thinks if I take enough for two meals I won't even have to go out to the fields in the evening to take the second one so he takes two at the, at the one time he's getting greedy you see and then somebody sees him doing it another being sees him doing it and he thinks he will do it as well and then they all start doing it instead of letting it grow everything provided for they've got greedy and they take enough for a day in the morning and then another guy or another being has uh, you know an even better idea he thinks he'll take for two days and for four days and for eight days so they become very very greedy when it's not necessary at all you see because everything is actually being provided but their defilements are getting more and more and more because of these defilements they start becoming very gross in their bodies and they separate into male bodies 
and female bodies. It's at a much more gross level. Remember when we started, these are self-luminous beings in the Brahma Loka, you know. Now they've come down through defilements. Because of those defilements, they come down, they come down. And now they're male and female. They recognize male and female. It's the same psychologically. When you're in uh, like a high jhana level, there's no sexuality in those levels. And there's no thoughts of sexuality either. Yeah, The mind is at an extremely refined level. As you come down from those levels of meditation, you start getting into the God realms, below the Brahma realms, but in the God realms, the gods, as you remember from last time, are sexually differentiated. So there are male and female gods. And then they start having sexual relations. When the other beings see them having sexual relations, they get very upset with them because it's such a gross thing to do and they pick up clods of earth and things and start throwing it at them pick up stones and start throwing stones at them and kind of attacking them you know because they're doing this kind of very gross act so what these beings have to do they, they actually start building houses so they can go into the houses and have sexual relations and nobody sees them and nobody throws clots of earth at them. Same now, actually. If, if you saw somebody having sexual relations, you know, in, in the middle of the street, you'd probably pick up a stick, you know, chase them away, wouldn't you? You see? So everybody goes in their homes, then they can do what they like. When, when they've got their own houses, the, the next thing that they start to do is build fences around the houses. So they build these houses and then, you know, they're isolated from the other beings. Before, all these beings were just shining together in the universe. Now they've come right down. They're in private quarters. They've got private property. They're having sexual relationships. They're storing up their food. All of these kind of gross things have happened. And how it happens really, if, if you think back, is through sensuality. They find this very refined matter and one of the beings takes a taste and it's actually very uh, sweet and everything. That's the start of the decline. Everything in Buddhism that's happening cosmologically is connected to the moral universe or the ethical universe. It's because of defilements that things become gross and it's because of overcoming the defilements that things become refined. In actual fact, you can see it in meditation. It's exactly the same thing. It's nothing exceptional or anything like that, but this intrinsic ethical universe is a completely different picture of the universe to what science gives, for instance. Science has no ethics involved in it. There's no ethical point to it. There's no morality in the universe. It just happens. But there's no causation on an ethical level in the scientific outlook. You yourself, if you're doing meditation... You can see how this works. If you've got a refined mind, sexuality disappears. Once your mind becomes gross, sexuality reappears again. So it's this kind of lust for sensuality, even on a very refined level, makes the world more gross. So then you get this kind of private sexual life and then private property before everything's shared in common now there's this kind of urge to isolate yourself from the community. And then, because of this, all these other nasty things start arising. When private property is involved, then somebody will see, you know, I've got nothing and he's got stores of stuff. And what they do, having nothing themselves, they go 
and they want to steal from the person who has more. Because it's no longer shared in common, you see, but some people are accumulating large amounts of private property and other people don't have anything. So poverty has arisen in the world. The first thing is poverty arises in the world. The next thing is that stealing arises in the world. And then when stealing arises, of course, people start blaming each other. So there's this censuring comes. Censuring, of course, is part of bad speech, yeah? It's part of wrong speech. So all these kind of um, gross things arise. That means sexuality, greediness for property, stealing, censoring, lying. And then they have to do something about it. So what are they going to do about it? They decide from amongst all the people, all the property owners, get together and they decide to elect a king. And the king will be the person who rules it over everybody. And then when anybody has done anything wrong, he will capture them and then he will punish them. So the next thing that arises, you see, is punishment. All of this part of the story has actually come from Aganya uh, Sutta in the Diga Nikaya. There's another uh, Sutta in the Diga Nikaya called Chakawati Siyanada Sutta, which is talking about the universal king. And th there's another devolution story regarding the Chakawati king. The Chakawati king is the universal monarch. If you remember, when the Bodhisattva was born, then the Brahmins came forward and said he will have one of two destinies. Either he becomes a universal monarch, or if he leaves the household life and goes forth into the homeless life, then he will become a Buddha. The universal monarch is very similar in many ways to the Buddha. You know the Buddha has 32 great marks, all these special marks. Well, the universal monarch also has those marks. They're at a very high level, but it depends on their choice whether they become a universal monarch or whether they become a Buddha. But his choice on this one matter on whether he decides to be a universal monarch and rule the world justly, or whether he decides to go forth and become a Buddha and then teach the Dhamma to liberation, you know, depends on what choice he makes when he grows up. Even the uh, universal monarch teaches Dhamma. The universal monarch has these seven special things. He has this wheel... Now, the wheel is actually the most important thing for the universal monarch because when he becomes the universal monarch, the universal monarch doesn't conquer by the sword or by the army. The wheel goes ahead of him and the people, when they see the Dhamma wheel, they understand that a universal monarch has arisen in the world and they make allegiance to him because they know that a universal monarch is going to rule justly. So they accept allegiance to him. They don't go to battle with him because he's conquering by Dhamma, not conquering by the sword. Normally, you know, countries go out and fight battles and if they're strong enough, you know, you, you have to pay allegiance to them. Because if, they, if you don't, they're going to chop your head off or whatever, you know, they're going to murder you or murder your family or make life hell or whatever like that. And that's, normal, that's the normal way that people conquer, isn't it? You know, if you look in history, that's the kind of normal way that, th that things happen. One country conquers another through force. But in, in this, this way, he doesn't conquer by force, he conquers by Dhamma. And then he has a wheel... He has an elephant, a white elephant. I think it's six tusked, actually. Chad Danta, it's called in Pali. And a horse, and a jewel, and a woman, and a householder, 
and a counselor. And these are all his kind of helpers for being a universal monarch. In this sutta, the universal monarch is called Dalha Naimi. Now, Dalha Naimi was not only a universal monarch, but he was very wise as well. He said to his counselor, keep your eye on the Dhamma wheel. When the Dhamma wheel starts falling away, you let me know. In those days, lives were very long. They, they go on for 84,000 years. Very, very long time. So after about 60,000 years, the counselor sees that the Dhamma wheel is falling away. And he tells the king, Dalanami, the wheel is falling away. And Dalanami says, it's time for me to go forth. It's time for him to ordain. He must pass the kingdom now to his son and he will go forth and he'll spend the rest of his life. He's got another 24,000 years. He'll spend the rest of his life developing this spiritual life. So he passes it to his son. But the wheel doesn't go up by it just like that. The next king has to earn this position as universal monarch, he cannot simply inherit it from his father. Because this is, again, a moral position. It's an ethical position. It isn't just come through bloodline. So the wheel actually goes down, and then the son takes over the, the monarchy, and the king tells him he must speak to the advisors, the Brahmins and the ascetics and get good advice from them and follow that advice so the son does that and he becomes a universal monarch himself and then the wheel goes back up into the sky and he is the new universal monarch but it's only because he's following the advice of the brahmins and the you know the ascetics right the, these are the things that they advise him to do. The first thing he must have is devotion to Dhamma. The king, to be a real, a real universal monarch, he must have devotion to the Dhamma. The Dhamma really means the way things are, you know, the truth about the universe. Then he must establish God. If you remember in the first story, this is one of the main functions that he's doing. He's establishing guard over the people so that the people are safe and can live safely. If we think about a, a government today, that's one of the functions of the government is security, national security. So it's the same thing. But he must be, you know, the kings today are not devoted to Dhamma, you know, they're devoted to their pockets, you know. They're, they're devoted to corruption, actually. Really, it's true. More or less anywhere you go, you know, it, it's, it's actually the same. To greater and lesser degrees, you, but you hardly ever find anybody that's really devoted to any sort of Dhamma. Somebody you might think that was kind of like that in the, in the modern world, who actually became head of state, is somebody like Nelson Mandela. If you think of Nelson Mandela... He was imprisoned for all that time, but he never held a grudge against the people who imprisoned him. And when, when it, you know, they got black majority rule in South Africa and he became uh, president, he didn't kind of execute all the predecessors. He tried to uh, kind of mollify them, if you like, tried to kind of make them feel like this was still their home. So in, in many ways he was acting according to Dhamma, you know. He didn't take vengeance on the people who had treated him cruelly and evilly for, you know, uh, like decades and decades. He could have done that. Having now got power, he could have put them in prison and tortured them like they tortured him. But he didn't do that. And he tried to kind of reconcile the white population to black majority rule and give them a place in the country and so on. So he was kind of, uh, you know, it's some sort of way in which he was kind of ruling by Dhamma. The third thing is preventing crime. Fourth thing is a very important thing. 
if they find that somebody doesn't have enough, they give them the property that it, that they need to be able to sustain their lives. So nobody is wanting. There's no poverty in the land. It's a very important thing. So part of being devoted to Dhamma is making sure that everybody has enough. Yeah. If everybody has enough, then a lot of these other problems don't arise. And then another part of it is that they support the Brahmins and ascetics in the world. That is, people who have gone away from lay life and actually living a, a life dedicated in one way or another to the Dhamma. In any given generation, you're going to have that situation where people actually are not interested in the material life. They're more interested in the spiritual life and they actually want to put the... Uh, teaching into practice, they go out. So it's the duty, you see, of a universal monarch or anybody following the ideals of Buddhist kingship, it's their duty to also support the monastic orders. So you can see in, um, you know, a good example is in Thailand to the present day. You know, if, if you look, the kings have always been the biggest supporters of the Sangha. You know, it's their duty. They must do it to be Buddhist kings. So they build temples, they give dhanas, they make sure that everything is kind of um, conducive for people to live and teach the Dhamma. The, s the next one is actually learning the Dhamma from these ascetics who have gone forth. The king of Thailand also goes to, uh, you know, to the monasteries and he listens to the Dhamma and then he must also do good deeds and avoid evil deeds. So it's just sabapa pasara karanan kusalasa upasampada. Putting aside all bad things and establishing all good deeds. These are the duties for the universal monarch. As long as he undertakes these duties, then he will become the universal monarch, the Dhamma chakra, that means the Dhamma wheel will r rise again in the uh, sky and he will be the universal monarch for that era. So the first generation, it went okay. Dalanami told his son, you must have these qualities. If you have these qualities, you will be the universal monarch. And he did it. The second generation, okay. Third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation, sixth generation, seventh generation, and we come to a problem. The king thinks, you know, probably because, you know, he just sees it's his birthright. His father, his father's father, his father's father's father, you know, going back seven generations, they've all been universal monarchs, so he must be the universal monarch, but he acts according to his own ideas. And his own ideas are quite good. Many of these things he actually puts into practice. But one thing he doesn't put into practice, for those people who are living in poverty, he doesn't make sure that they have enough to live on. So the first thing that arises in the devolution is poverty. Because of the arising of poverty, you get the arising of theft. People don't have enough to live on, so they have to steal from the people who do have enough to live on. Then there's an interesting thing. It's very interesting psychologically. The king calls the first person who steals, he calls that person to his court, and he says, is it true that you've been stealing? And the guy says, it is true, king. I have been stealing. And he says, why have you been stealing? He says, I'm so poor, I don't have enough to live on. And the king says, give that man enough to live on. You would think it was a good idea. And that guy gets enough to live on, and then he tells the other people, because I've been stealing, the king gave me property. So a second guy tries stealing. And the king thinks, okay, so he says, why have you been stealing? And he says, I don't have enough to live on. So the king gives the second one. 
some property as well. And then the people start getting the idea. When we're stealing, the king gives us property. So they all start stealing. Then the king gets the idea as well. If I give property to the people who are stealing, there's more and more people stealing. What I need to do is punish them. So the next guy that comes along, he says, why have you been stealing? He says, because I'm poor. And he says, take him out and cut it off his head. So killing arises in the world. The king kills. It's very interesting psychologically, you see, what is happening. So the next guy is stealing because there's poverty all around. The next guy starts stealing. You know, they take him to the king and, and they say, have you been stealing? The others have said yes, but the last one who said yes got his head cut off. So he says no. He denies it. Lying appears in the world. More and more gross defilements are arising in the devolution of the world. All coming from poverty, you see. Poverty, theft, killing, lying and bad speech. That means people start accusing other people saying he's been stealing. Because of this, the people start becoming much more gross. Originally, under the universal monarch, the people were very refined because they were all living according to Dhamma. Now, because of the arising of poverty, they've started to become very gross. And then they start getting jealous and envious of other people's wives and other people's husbands. Because some are very beautiful and some are very ugly. So the ugly ones want the beautiful ones. So adultery arises in the world and even things like incest start arising in the world. Wrong views arise in the world and wrong practice arises in the world. Now while all this is happening lifespans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. While the universal monarch was reigning, 84,000 years was the lifespan. And then it becomes 42,000, 21,000, 10,000, you know. It's halving and halving and halving. As these defilements arise in the world, so it comes down. Now, you look, actually, when our Lord Buddha arose in the world, the lifespan at that time was known to be 100 years. It's at a very gross time, actually. But it goes down even further. We're still devolving. I think it's true as well, actually. If you, if you look at the Lord Buddha's time, I mean, a lot of these gross crimes that you see every day in the newspapers... You don't hear of those sort of crimes in Lord Buddha's time, you know. There, there must, of course, have been... There were thieves and dacoits and things like that around, even in Lord Buddha's time. But a lot of the crimes that you hear about today... I mean, you look at these kind of crimes that happen in America, where people just walk into schools and just, just shoot down children. The grossness of the mind... Of the person who's done the last person who did that, you know, in Connecticut, actually he killed his mother first. After killing his mother, he went to the school and then he mowed down 30 people, I think. I think 20, 20 or more of them were children between the ages of five and six. Those sort of crimes, we didn't used to hear about those sort of crimes, but we hear about them now. There is really a kind of devolution of morality. So life gets more and more gross and lifespans get shorter and shorter. And eventually it gets down to people are living only to the age of 10. It said girls become mature at the age of 5 and start having babies. And all the things like all the food and everything like that all of this becomes very gross. Whereas before it was this nice cream pie, very sweet and very nourishing and very wonderful. Now all the food is like very rough, unhusked rice and that's all they've got to eat. And then, you know, the, these children who are mothers and fathers 
are, you know, they're actually having sexual relations with their parents, with their sisters. Incest is rife, and the whole society is degenerated. It's really become very gross. At that point, there's actually what they called the sword interval. This sword interval is where everybody just starts attacking each other with swords. They're killing each other. You know, they're they're attacking their their parents. It doesn't matter. You know, they're attacking other people, even their wives or their children. They just attack them. It's just like a madness, you know, where people are just killing and killing and killing for no kind of reason, except that they're totally insane by this point. Their their defilements are so. Heavy and so gross, there's just like an insanity of attacks. Actually, even this is not outside of what you can understand happening. I I don't know if you've seen any of the films coming out of Syria. I I mean, sometimes you've got attacks on bread lines. People, that means women and children, stood in bread lines waiting to go to bakeries because they have to eat they have to get food and somebody just strafes them you know or sends a bomb in and then you know the people are just with limbs missing or with you know I, I, I saw one I saw one recently actually about what's happening to children so you've got children being taken into hospitals makeshift hospitals not like you know like the hospital you find in BM I mean these are hospitals you know with their guts out uh, with their arms missing and everything like this, you know. So, you know, the, the reason I say this is because these things, if you just say that people go wild and insane and just start killing, you think it's not realistic or something. Actual fact, it's happening. It happens now. It's happening at this point, you know. In places like Syria, they do this. They detonate bombs, you know, in civilian areas and just blow people to pieces. No kind of um, real targeting, just anybody, anywhere, if they're identified as being on the wrong side of the line. But most of the people, of course, are just civilians. They're, they're only civilians. They're just like you and me. They're not engaged in a war or anything, but just people just start you know, killing them. So at this point, right, where everybody is insane and everybody is just murdering each other and just kind of, uh, you know, at the, at the very kind of worst possible situation they can be in morally, somebody gets an idea that they must refrain from taking life. First precept. These people actually go out into the forest, away from the cities where all this kind of murder and mayhem is going on. They go out into the forest and they decide to uh, refrain from taking life. They're still stealing and kind of lying and cheating and stuff because, you know, that's just where their mindset is at. Uh, but because they refrain from taking life, their lifespan gets longer. So instead of 10 years, they live to be 15 years or something, you can say. Then they notice, you know, that there's a causal relationship between doing wholesome deeds and living longer. So they decide not to steal also, not to take what is not being given. The second thing, they start to keep the second precept. Their lives get longer. Their minds get more refined. They keep the third precept. They, re they abstain from sexual misconduct. Then they abstain from lying and bad speech. All the time, things are getting better. It's actually the same for everybody, really, you know. If you're involved in killing people, if you're in involved in stealing, in sexual misconduct, you're really putting your life on the line. If you're going to war, taking life, there's, you know, a real possibility somebody's going to try and kill you. If you're going to go there and try to kill them, they're going to try and kill you, isn't it? If you steal... You're going to steal it from somebody and they are not going to want it to happen. They are going to try and prevent it. Quite possibly they'll beat you or imprison you, kill you or do whatever it takes to stop you stealing. If you go into somebody else's wife or husband and you're caught, they're going to wallop you. Isn't it? So 
it's it's not it's not untrue. You see, your lifespan, you know, if you're living a moral life, is likely to be longer than somebody who's living an immoral life, because doing all these sorts of things is putting your life at stake. Whereas refraining from all these sort of things is going to be much better. It's also much better in a different way as well, in a psychological way. Because when you refrain from bad actions, like the next ones are lying and bad speech, incense, deviancy, all these sort of things, and you have respect for your parents, looking after your parents, having respect for ascetics and looking after ascetics, the quality of the mind also improves. The mind becomes more wholesome. The mind becomes more refined. When people have got a more refined mind, their bodies are also more stable. It's got to be the case. If you're living grossly, you're going to have a gross body as well. It's just what the whole story of this evolution and devolution has been about. If you've got a refined way of living, your mind is more refined, then your body is going to be you know, more stable, more long-lasting. It's, it's, you know, just plain sense, actually. People who are living like a rough life, taking drugs, eat, you know, drinking booze, womanizing, gambling, you know, thieving, and all the rest of it, you know, they very often, you know, just, just finish in a ditch after 30 years or something. Whereas people who are meditating actually live very long lives. So again, you see, people who live in a very wholesome a very meditative way they live very long lives generally speaking of course it also depends quite a lot on past camera and stuff like this but as a generalized population it's true so then the world starts re-evolving life stands start getting longer people start living more virtuous lives and it goes on and on up until we get back to 84,000 years, at which time King Sanka arises in the world. And King Sanka becomes the new universal monarch. He undertakes all those duties that we were discussing before. And he also supports all the ascetics and all like this. Now it's at the time of King Sanka that a very, very special person arises. The next Buddha arises, Metteya Buddha. You see, the world goes through a devolution. During that devolution, of course, the Dhamma, the Sasana, all the teaching is lost. We no longer have the Sasana. Then you start on the upward curve, people starting to become more moral and so on. And it goes up again, so that it becomes a very moral universe, if you like, or a very moral world again. At that point, then Metteya Buddha arises in the world. And his story at that point is the same as Lord Gotama's uh, story was. The, all the Buddhas go through the same things, you know. They all get married when they're young. They go forth from the house life into the homeless life after their first son has been born. He goes forth and then eventually, after not so long as our Buddha, right? our Buddha had to go to the forest and do ascetic practice for six years. Metteya Buddha doesn't do it for that long, but he goes through the ascetic practices and then he attains enlightenment under his own enlightenment tree. You know, our Gotama Buddha attained enlightenment under the fig tree. But Metteya Buddha has his own tree. All Buddhas have their own trees. They're all known as Bodhi trees, but they all have their own trees. And then he teaches, the, you know, once he's attained awakening, he also teaches the, the, you know, the same teaching, really, that Gotama uh, taught the Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, the Eightfold Path, the Seven Factors of Enlightenment, and all the other things that, that have been taught to us as well. So everybody say Sadhu. Sadhu.